Right. So this is the last lecture before an exam. And so what I'm going to do is um, walk through a case study. Let's look at reacting systems of ideal gases in a little more detail. And then uh, if there's time remaining, I want to do Nernst in a nutshell, just for fun. Okay. So we're going to start with reacting systems of ideal gases. And um, this pen is on its way out, so let me switch. And we're going to consider uh, a reaction of the form A plus B going to 2C. And later on, I'm going to plug in some numbers. And uh, I plugged in numbers for hydrogen plus chlorine goes to 2HCl, uh, which is uh, all in the gas phase. And this is also generically discussed in the textbook. So that's sort of convenient. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to ask, what can we learn What can we learn from plots of free energy versus composition? Free energy versus system composition. So free energy. Gives free energy is the sum of partial molar gives free energy weighted by the moles. And uh, we know that we decompose this into the sum of the contributions of the pure, pure components before they were mixed. And then we have this ideal solution model. So, right. So composition, Right, is expressed by those N of I's. We have pure component I at pressure P. That's the reference state. And then here we have a system that was mixed at fixed T and total P. So just remembering what those terms are. Okay, now uh, we're gonna start analyzing this in a little more detail. Uh -oh. All right, so for a univariant reacting system, Univariant, that meant that there's only one variable, right? Univariant. And that's a system with only one reaction. So the reaction can run to the right or run to the left. There's only one reaction coordinate. We saw this in almost all of the examples that we did. The composition can be expressed with respect to a single a single variable. So we saw this uh, before and right here we're going to write with respect to NC. So I'm just going to arbitrarily choose the third component. And so we know that D and A equals D and B equals in this case, minus one half D and C. Remember, this is A plus B going to two C, right? And we get these from D and I over nu of I equals constant. Okay, good. And so that means that N of A equals N of A initial plus 
the total change of n of a, and we just plug that in, n of a initial minus one half n of c minus n of c initial. Okay, so this is um, again, stuff we've seen before in one form or another. N of B initial minus one half N of C minus N of C initial. That's um, just integrating those changes. That's good. And of course, uh, N of C, well, that's our independent variable. So N of C equals N of C. Uh, so that's good. Now we've re-expressed this univariant system with only one variable, N of C. Everything is in terms of N of C. That's good. Um, we're also going to need, also going to, also going to need n total, right, equals, and for this particular system, this happens to equal n of a initial plus n of b initial plus n of c initial, and, um, that's not always guaranteed that the total number of moles is fixed. But for this reaction, for this one that we're doing, you have the destruction of two moles and the creation of two moles. So the number of moles is fixed. So it's just, uh, it just makes the math a little easier in this particular case. And we're going to need n of total in order to write my P of i's, right, which are total pressure over n of i over n total. So that's what we're going to need our n totals for. All right, so now we have um, we have uh, everything except for the reference data. Right, we wanted to write the Gibbs free energy as a function of composition, and, and we're well on our way. So, so now we can now write out the Gibbs free energy as a function of N of C. And plot it. Okay, so this is what we get. Gibbs free energy is N of A initial minus one half N of C minus N of C initial chemical potential of A in its reference state plus N of B initial minus one half N of C minus N of C initial times the chemical potential of B in its reference state plus N of C times the chemical potential of C in its reference state plus the contribution from the ideal entropy of mixing RT N of I log n of i over n total. Okay. Um, all right, so, so this so far is, none of this is new. I'm just writing things out a little more than I have in the past. So in order to go any farther, it's um, helpful to put some numbers in. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna consider Again, this reaction. Gas phase reaction, hydrogen plus chlorine going to hydrogen chloride. And we're going to consider this at 298 Kelvin. And I'll tell you, this, this reaction is really annoying. And this reaction is annoying for me personally because um, uh, in my lab and a lot of labs that are doing similar research, we would really like to use hydrogen containing precursors and chlorine containing precursors to, uh, to grow certain semiconductors. It could be a very effective way of growing certain semiconductors in films. The problem is that the reaction byproduct is hydrogen chloride or hydrochloric acid. And um, if you're making hydrochloric acid, you really can't have any metal in your system, 
especially downstream. And what that means is you can't use a lot of common semiconductor processing equipment. You have to use less common equipment. You have to use a lot of quartzware and so forth. And it stands as a pretty substantial barrier to running processes like this in the semiconductor industry where no one's really interested in swapping out stainless steel reactors for non-metal reactors. It can be done, but anyway, it's a problem. Okay, so uh, a little bit of an aside there. So let's see, the chemical potential of hydrogen, hydrogen, All right, what is that? We need to get this from databases. So we're gonna have a standard enthalpy of hydrogen minus T times the standard entropy of hydrogen. And by convention, the standard enthalpy of elements at 298K and one bar is zero by convention, by convention or definition. Elements in their standard state at 298 Kelvin, one atmosphere have H not set to zero. All right, similarly for mu chlorine not uh, chlorine two, this is H not chlorine minus T S not chlorine. And um, we don't need to look anything up there. And then we have the chemical potential of HCl in its standard state. And this is going to be H HCl not minus T S not HCl. And um, this is non zero because this is a compound. This is the formation enthalpy for one mole HCl from the elements. In their standard state. That's what that is. So you might see this as like this, one half H2 plus one half Cl2 going to HCl with an enthalpy of formation, sometimes written as delta F H. All right, so um, this is, so, so what do we do? We, we get data. And so you can find data for the standard entropy of, of these uh, components and the enthalpy of formation of HCl. You can find that data, let's say a NIST web book or pretty much anywhere else, these are all pretty common materials. Um, so I, I plotted some things. So we're gonna look at the plots. Okay, so this is, I, I plotted the function. This is what it looks like. So this is um, plotted for the case of, let me put a, grab a laser pointer here. This is plotted for uh, the case of, um, Initial moles of A and B is one, and initial moles of C is zero. I could have plotted, I could have chosen any, any starting conditions here. I just made it simple. So you start with a stoichiometric mixture of A and B and no C. And I plotted this uh, Gibbs free energy of the system as a function of NFC using data for hydrogen chlorine and hydrogen chloride. I did cheat a little bit. Um, I reduced the formation enthalpy of HCl just because it makes the plot easier to read by eye. So um, 
don't take these numbers to the bank. Don't use these in your future engineering and research endeavors. Um, but the science lesson still stands. So, um, right. So what, what is this plot telling us? Would somebody just please uh, interpret this? What does this mean? What's the meaning of it? Well, we can see that G is minimized approximately at 1.5 moles of uh, NC, that is HCl. So that being the lowest point, that's where the reaction will settle at equilibrium at this temperature. Great. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly right. The reaction, if you start over here on the left-hand side with no moles of C, the reaction will proceed to the right until the Gibbs free energy is minimized. And, and we see that point right here. Good. We also see it curve back up. So there was a problem on the preset about this curvature. And this curvature is always, always here, even if it gets pushed really close to the y-axis. This is to say that at equilibrium, no reaction ever runs all the way to one side at equilibrium. Right. There's always a little bit of mixing. And that comes from the singularity of x log x. Okay, so that's another thing to see. You can see here that in this case, that the starting Gibbs free energy on the left-hand side is, is higher than the Gibbs free energy if you had full conversion, All right? So there's a driving force here for the reaction to run to the right initially. I don't know. Um, not sure, I'm not sure what else to say here. All right, now what I did is I, uh, I repeated the calculation for 328 Kelvin. And so uh, how did I do that? Let me, let me switch back to the camera for a minute. We'll come back to this data, but I want somebody to, to remind us how I would have calculated this for, uh, for a different temperature. So all right, we have here the Gibbs free energy. And now I want to calculate this for a temperature other than 298 Kelvin. What do I need? What data do I need? Right here, I have temperature here. So obviously I can, I can change that number from 298 to, to a different number. But is that the only thing that I need to keep track of or is there something else? There's also the heat capacities for H standard. You need the heat capacities for each component. Can you tell me why? What do I do with those heat capacities? I think you can get the H, like the H T of that, like the H, uh, the enthalpy as a function of time. Right. I need to change the enthalpy from enthalpy at 298 to enthalpy at a different temperature. I also need to update the entropy. Right. So I integrate heat capacity here. I integrate heat capacity over temperature here. I also have to change the temperature here. So what I'm doing is I'm using the heat capacity data to calculate the standard chemical potential at some other temperature. That's right. So just a reminder there. So I needed heat capacity data for all three components. And I did those calculations. I just programmed this in MATLAB. So it, it did it for me. And I updated H's and I updated S's. I updated mu's. And I plug that all into this expression. So I have an updated mu, updated mu, updated mu. Um, and of course, I, I just changed the temperature there. And, and then I replotted. So let's see. Let's go back to go back to the graphs here. Okay, so I replotted. So uh, what let's see. Uh, can somebody speak to um, what is this plot telling us? I mean, the, the, the 328 Kelvin plot is below the 298 Kelvin plot. Can somebody offer an explanation as to why that is? Why did it overall drop instead of rise? Could it have to do with this reaction being either exothermic or endothermic? So I love that and we're getting there. But in this case, that's not the dominant um, effect. In this case, that's not the dominant effect. Um, somebody else?
Could it be because the temperature is higher, so the formation enthalpy, sorry, the um, delta G has to be lower? Yeah, it has to do not so much with any sort of reaction or formation, but it has to do with this functional form. DG for any system equals minus S DT plus P DV plus ba ba ba. So um, the trend in temperature of Gibbs free energy tends to be negative because Gibbs varies with temperature with a slope of minus s and entropy is strictly positive. Now there could be other things changing, right? You can have volume changing, sorry, VDP. You could have volume changing, you could have number of moles changing, but just sort of as a, as a rule of thumb, for almost any system, Gibbs tends to go down as the temperature rises. And it comes simply from that coefficient. Okay. All right, so that we can see, we can see that the, uh, the overall thing shifted down, but it's a little bit hard to compare these two curves when, when they're so shifted, the dynamic range of the plot is kind of too big. And so what I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna do it what they do in the textbook and I'm gonna plot, um, just arbitrarily, the Gibbs free energy minus two times the Gibbs free energy of C naught. So what I'm basically doing is I'm um, pegging these plots to zero on the right-hand side. You can peg it to zero on the left-hand side, and same thing, basically. Um, and so now I can zoom in a little bit. Now I can, I can draw another conclusion from, this, from these plots by comparing them. You see, I, I have them now on the same plot, so I get the full dynamic range of the plot. And then I'm going to zoom in even farther. So now we're zoomed way in around the minima. Um, would somebody like to point out an observation about these equilibrium points? Can you draw any conclusions about this reaction from what's plotted here? The increasing temperature drives the reaction to the uh, to the left. The left, yeah. So Samuel is pointing out that uh, as you cool, as you heat up. Sam is pointing out that the minimum in Gibbs free energy at 298 Kelvin is over here, and it seems to shift a little bit to the left as we increase the temperature. It's a little subtle. You need to look closely, but it's visible if you zoom in. Zoom in. Thank you, Zoom. All right. Um, right, so I'll, I'll, well, yeah, I'll ask a couple questions, and these are the questions which we're going to analyze. Two questions. First, is the reaction endothermic or exothermic? And two, can you estimate the reaction enthalpy from the data on the screen. Okay, so who wants to tackle number one? Question one, is this reaction endothermic or exothermic? Is it exothermic? Is it exothermic? And um, okay, why? Uh, because we see that um, with an increase in temperature, it shifts to the left. So we would expect heat to be a product of the reaction so that when it increases um, by Le Chatelier's principle, it will shift to the side that reduces the amount of heat. Yes, exactly. Thank you. That was very clearly said. So Le Chat says systems, I should say reacting, says that reacting systems, um, quote unquote, resist Right. They don't have bumper stickers. They, they don't actually know what they're doing, but um, they quote unquote resist the temperature rises by running in endothermic direction, right? They try to soak up that heat. The endothermic direction. So this reaction is observed to run to left, right, with increasing T. So running backwards is endothermic. So as written, it's exothermic. Good, okay, that's good. And uh, we'll also just remember Van Hoft 
Bent Hoff said D log K P D T equals delta H naught over R T squared, which is basically saying the same thing. All right. What we're, what we're observing is that this, um, uh, this is negative, right? The reaction at equilibrium is, is uh, shifting to the left. So KP is getting smaller as we raise temperature. So this, this slope is negative and indeed we have an exothermic delta H. Okay, good. So that's a sort of a concept question. All right, but what about number two? This is a little bit more involved. So I'm just gonna step through this. Using Van Hoff, using Van Hoff, if we can estimate d log kp dt, then we can estimate the enthalpy of the reaction. So, so that's useful. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. Um, I'm gonna ask the class, how would I estimate this? How would I estimate this quantity? Isn't KFP equal to the partial pressures of the products over the partial pressures of the reactants? Uh, right, right. But this is the data I'm given. So is there something you could do with this? Well, given that it's a ideal gas system, we have the number of moles at equilibrium of HCl. And from there, we can extract the number of moles of the reactants, which would be a substitute for the partial pressures. Great. That's fantastic. That's exactly what I'm looking for. Thank you. So, um, so I just showed that plot again, just to sort of jog your minds. And that's right. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at these two temperatures for which we're given data, 298 and 328. And we're going to eyeball, right? We're going to eyeball the equilibrium number of moles of C. And I did that. Uh, you could do it if you were still looking at the plot. It's not hard to do. Uh, I eyeballed it. I didn't solve it numerically or anything. I just sort of did it to two decimal points, 1.55 and 1.53. Okay. So that's it. That is the data that we need. From there, everything is calculations. Okay, so NC at equilibrium is 1.55 and 1.53. We already have expressions for NA and NB in terms of NC. And you can figure out from the stoichiometry of the problem, it comes out to 0 0.225 and 0 0.23. Uh, sorry, 0 0.235. So now I have the mole numbers. And what we just heard was basically Dalton's law, right? That we can get the partial pressures and therefore the equilibrium constants from the mole numbers. So I went ahead and calculated those from these numbers, 47.5 and 42.4. And just as a reminder here, this is using P I equals N I over N total. And again, just to make it very, very clear what I did, for example, 47.5, what is that? That's 1.55 divided by two squared over 0 0.235 divided by two times another factor of 0 0.235 divided by two reaction coefficient. So that's an example. All right, so these are, you know, as usual with thermal, the actual calculations are exceedingly simple. It's just figuring out what goes where. Okay, good. And, and then what, then what do we do? Using these estimates, Well, we don't have a, a derivative, but we have some changes. The change in log K of P, I calculated it, is minus 0 0.114. The change in temperature was um, 30 Kelvin. 
those are the two data points we were given. And so we will just say, well, um, I'm in a rush and this is all the data I have. So uh, let's say that this derivative is approximately equal to rise over run. And this comes out to minus 0 0.00379. The units here are inverse Kelvin. And there, that's it. So delta H naught equals R T squared D log KP DT. And I'm going to say it's approximately equal to, okay, I estimated that R is a constant. What temperature should I use? What temperature should I use? Maybe like the average temperature, so like the one in the middle. Yeah, that works. Anything will really do. You know, you remember this from calculus, when you take the derivative, you can like evaluate a function in the left or the middle or the right, stuff like that. So I'll use midpoint. Anything will do. You just have to use a number, right? You can't just leave it as t. So we'll use a midpoint. And if I do that, I say minus 3.09 kilojoules. And uh, that's the answer to the question that was given, right? Estimate the enthalpy of this reaction. It's exothermic as expected, that's good. And I'll, I'll let you know that uh, when I generated that plot, I used minus two kilojoules. So the, the plots are generated from minus two kilojoules um, and the heat capacities. And this rough estimate gets us minus three kilojoules. All right, well, anyway, the starting point. The idea was an estimate. Yeah, I will leave you, uh, I wanna move on, but I'll leave you with just some ideas, right? How to find temp You wanna make sure that you know how to calculate the temperature dependence of humidity rise a little while ago. You want to make sure we do this. And it's just an interesting question. Can we estimate the heat capacity difference across this reaction from a temp series? Of G of M of C. Right, so we didn't see just now a temperature series. We really just saw two two temperatures, but if you had a bunch of temperatures, if you had a whole family of curves at different temperatures, um, you know, you could estimate heat capacity differences from that. And uh, it's interesting to think about how you might go about that, at least formally. All right, so in the time remaining, I'd like to move on to NERNS, um, unless there are really burning questions about this, in which case I'm happy to stall. Oh, I had a question about, um, I guess, going back towards the start of working on this problem. Uh, so in this particular reacting system with HCl, we do have that n total is equal to a constant because yeah. for two moles of reacting, we have two moles of product. Yeah. How would you deal with that not being the case? Um, it's, it's, it's formally not hard. It's just get a little annoying. The computer will take care of it for you. Basically what you do is you have these expressions here for an A and B and NC, and it's all in terms of NC. So we've reduced everything to one variable, right? Mm -hmm. um, all that means is that the N total, which is the sum of NIs, will also then in general have an NC dependence. Okay. Um, everything else follows. It all follows here. Uh, when you, right, when that's, you know, that general have an NC dependence there in the denominator, but plug it in and plot it, you know, it's, it's um, in general here, right? I have N total here, right? When using Dalton's law, I just went ahead and plugged in twos there. In general, you'd need to calculate N total and it would be not other than two. So that'd be another place where you need to keep track of it. Good question. Okay, anything else? Um, it's a nice, uh, 
it's a nice reaction form to analyze to just understand the math and the formalism and the fundamentals of this um, because of that conserved mole number. Adding a varying mole number is a, is a complication. Uh, of course, it's realistic, right? There's lots of systems you'll analyze in, in your careers that will not have fixed mole number, but um, it's a complication. And so that's why uh, you know I chose here to do A plus B equals 2C, likewise in the textbook and lots of other textbooks. We like to sort of stick with simple cases first. All right, so now I want to just um, switch gears and just take you on a very quick walk through the Nernst equation. And you can just sort of, you know, Stop taking notes if you like, and just let this sort of wash over you. It, it's it's just for context. It's just for context. All right. So what we're going to do? We're going to take a redox reaction. Take a redox reaction. And this. And why I'm doing this now, by the way, it's because it couples nicely to some stuff which we have done in this class recently. And it couples nicely to what you're going to be doing in 023. Um, so that's why we're doing this now. Okay, so we take a redox reaction. I'm going to use this one. It's a very well-known reaction. This is called a Daniel, Daniel cell. Uh, there's a guy, I had to look this up, J.F. Daniel. And we're talking about the 1830s. He's making batteries out of zinc and copper and sulfates. So. It's a very kind of, so we take this redox reaction, great. And this is sort of key. We're going to separate the reduction and the oxidation half reactions in a device. This is about making stuff, making devices. In a device engineered such that electrons and ions follow separate paths. So you have to know something about plumbing, you have to know something about electronics, right? This is fun, this is fun. So th this, is, this is an example for the Daniel cell. This is what that would actually look like. What on earth does that actually look like? This is what that would actually look like. We're having two beakers here, two beakers. These two beakers. And what are we gonna do here? Uh, we're going to have a rod of zinc metal. A rod of zinc metal. And we're gonna have a rod of copper metal. And then we're also gonna have something called a salt bridge, which can be uh, a, a U-shaped pipette, not pipette, but a U-shaped tube filled with brine, basically. And this is aqueous. So these are aqueous systems. So and what do we have here in Solution, we have zinc sulfate, aqueous, aqueous zinc sulfate, and aqueous copper sulfate. And so we have a system where ions can go this way, but we still need somewhere for electrons to go. And so electrons we pull out through external circuitry put two terminals there. And these are the voltage current terminals. And what I've just drawn, um, if you abstract away the details is every battery ever made or every electrochemical reduction system ever made. Um, but you know, Anyway, we don't have time for everything ever made. We're just going to step through this example. Okay, so that's what we did. Now let's keep on going. The electrostatic work. Do you guys remember introductory physics? The work of moving 
charge N F across potential E. We tend to use this sort of scripty E. This is also known as electromotive force, but it's also sometimes just written as V. What's NF? N equals moles. F equals the number of coulombs per mole of electrons. 96,485 coulombs per mole. This is known as Faraday's constant. The electrostatic work of doing that is, um, I'm gonna call this W star, which is also the change in energy of the system. And this is from introductory physics. We have a displacement dot product with the electric field. So this is a force dot product with the distance field displacement displacement field let's see dot product and um, if you remember how voltage is defined it's the spatial integral of a directed field so n f e so the work the negative work which is the minus change in energy of a system of moving n moles of charge across potential epsilon is NFE. Okay. We're also going to take something called the generalized work theorem, which I don't have time to derive, but hopefully it's a little bit intuitive. The change of Gibbs free energy is W star, where W star is any reversible work. So, so far in this class, and really for the entirety of this class, we only deal with mechanical work, right? PDV work, and that's fine. But just for this one 20 minute segment, 15 minute segment, we're gonna deal, deal with electrostatic work. We're gonna admit that there are other ways other than mechanical ways of changing the energy of the system through work. And this is electro electrical work, electrostatic work. Okay, so if we take this and we combine it with this, we get something called the Nernst equation. And the Nernst equation is very simple. The change in Gibbs free energy of a system is minus NFE as the change of Gibbs free energy for moving N moles through a potential of E. Okay, but we're gonna keep going here. We're gonna use stuff we already know, formalism of reacting systems to write Delta G with respect to activities or if you like concentrations. So for instance, in this case, Delta G equals Delta G not plus R T natural log. And remembering the form of our reaction here, zinc sulfite activity copper, activity, copper sulfate, activity, zinc metal. This here is the reaction quotient. All right, so what we're gonna do is, is now we're going to use Nernst to couple electrostatics that was from the previous board. We're going to couple electrostatics and chemistry. So this was thermochemistry. 
this was electrostatics. And so what happens when electrostatics and chemistry get married? You get electrochemistry. And it's written as follows. N F E equals minus delta G naught minus R T ln of Q. And this is also sometimes called the Nernst equation, right? This is a cell voltage, something you can measure easily with a voltmeter. This is a reference. And this reaction coefficient, coefficient depends on concentrations. So for the Danel cell, we have, for example, for a Danel cell, we have epsilon, not epsilon, sorry. Electric potential is a reference potential minus RT over 2F log concentration of zinc sulfite with a concentration copper sulfite sulfate. What are these? X. X's are concentrations in aqueous solution. E naught are reference potentials. Reference potential defined for a reference state. And in this case, it would be concentration of the two aqueous components equals one molo, molal. And I made n equals two because this particular redox involves two electrons. You remember the, the formal charge on sulfate or copper or zinc here. Okay, so that was very fast, but I think it was worth it because now you've seen this stuff. And then as you see it again in other classes, hopefully there'll be some connections to some, some material from O2O.